on this episode of Season 4, Let's Talk. For me, I got away from that because at a certain level, um, baseball, you can't really do that the same way as you can in basketball or in hockey. It's just because the way the game is played. But for myself to mentally prepare myself, I have a routine that I follow. So I have a pregame routine where I warm up and stretch the same way to make sure my body's ready to go. And then I do a small meditation before the game. And at the minute I finish that meditation, it's game over. It's like a snap of the finger. I completely lock in to whereas it doesn't matter if it's my best friend across the field from me, I'm going to kill that person. We're going to win the game. Hey folks, welcome back to The Rajiv Show and I'm your host Rajiv Doreswamy and this show aims to help reach out to those who are currently struggling in life and to remind you that life is indeed beautiful when you're inspired to make it your own. Welcome back to The Rajiv Show and we are going international again. This time my friend from Berlin, uh, Jack Johnson and legendary baseball player a phenomenal person and uh jack how are you doing today zach oh sorry long pronunciation <laughs> how are you no doing no problem today? it's all good i'm doing really good uh thank you very much for having me i'm happy to be here and excited to uh, be able to share a bit of insight and story with your listeners awesome uh could you give my listeners a little bit of background about you yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously, I really appreciate the interview and having me on the, the show, Rajiv. And um, yeah, for myself, I grew up in Canada. I'm originally from British Columbia in a small town in the southeast corner of British Columbia in the Rocky Mountains. Um, if any of you are familiar with that area, I, I am from just south of Banff. Or if you're American, I'm just northeast of Spokane by about three hours. Um, grew up there. Grew up playing a lot of different sports. My sport, my world, or my life kind of revolved around sports. And uh, grew up playing hockey, um, not field hockey, ice hockey. Grew up playing ice hockey, and uh, grew up playing baseball in the summers. And then was kind of given an opportunity to reinvent my life. I was diagnosed with a heart condition, so I was no longer allowed to play ice hockey at the age of 15. Um, so that kind of crushed my dreams at that point. And that was kind of the first time I ever dealt with adversity. So. Learned at an early age that life wasn't necessarily going to be always be easy. So I turned to baseball, um, made some decisions along the way that, of course, you know, being young and stupid and kind of, I guess, a, a youth that's pissed off at the world. I made some decisions that I, you know, I look back on now and don't necessarily regret because I think everything that we do kind of gets us to the point that we're at. But, um, you know, kind of maybe the effect that it had on others around me, I think that's, you know, what I regret more than anything. But I um, was able to kind of straighten myself out a little bit and found myself going to a baseball academy in Alberta. Um, from there, I had a lot of really good success and actually ended up tearing my shoulder. I had complete shoulder reconstruction surgery. Um, from there, that was kind of the second big adversity I had had faced in my life and kind of knew what I was up against, but I dealt with some major depression and um, kind of just kept myself going. Uh, I had a lot of people tell me that I was never going to play baseball again. I had a lot of family members, close friends that, you know, kept trying to tell me because they were trying to protect me, but essentially they were telling me, Hey, you're never going to play again. You know, you should give it up, find a job, go to school, get a degree and, you know, kind of pack it in. And I, I wasn't willing to accept that. I know the surgeon told me there was a 60% chance I would never play. Um, I moved to California to go to junior college to be able to prove that I could play because I knew that I was talented enough to play professionally because before I got injured, that was what was going to happen. So I moved to California two months after shoulder surgery, did all of my rehab there. And typically the injury that I had, if people do come back from it, it takes anywhere between a year and a half and a year or sorry, a year and a half and two years, my apologies. Hmm. And I came back within eight and a half months um, from surgery to be able to play. So kind of just found um, some motivation within myself to be able to play. And then as Rajiv had said, I uh, play professional baseball. So obviously successfully was able to recover from my shoulder surgery, had a lot of success in California, 
from there signed as a free agent with the St. Louis Cardinals organization. I played developmental with them for a year and a half. And then from there, uh, I played in Puerto Rico. From Puerto Rico, I moved to Germany, played one summer in Germany. Then I went to Australia, came back to Germany, uh, met my soon to be wife and came back after the winter. I took the winter off from baseball that year. After the winter, I came back and played here again. Then my contract got bought by a team in the Netherlands. And then from there, a team in Toronto bought my contract. So 2018, primarily played in Toronto. And the past two winters, I've been in Germany with my soon-to-be wife. And the past two summers, I played in Toronto. So it's a little bit of a backstory on myself and kind of how I got to where I'm at. That's a lot, a lot. Um, my first questions that, that I normally ask my guest here in my show is that if you and I were high school, like, uh, who are you? Are you the introverted, uh, saying, as you mentioned, you, you, you spend a lot of this time, but in, in high school, were you also the same sporty, you know, or you were very shy and, uh, uh were you an open-minded kind of person who who studied a lot first and then played the game and how, how did you, uh, uh, who were you basically on, uh, in, in high school? Like if I were classmates with you? Um, I think for me, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a twofold question, I think, or I'm sorry, a twofold answer because I was almost two people in high school. My group of friends away from my sports team were, very smart, very intelligent people, people that read books, people that didn't party, didn't do a lot of the the high school nonsense that happens in small town Canada or in, you know, different parts of North America. Um, But then when I was around the sports team, I was a totally different person. So I kind of learned at an early age that, you know, you needed to essentially act via your company of where you were. And And I'm not saying that that's the best or how it should have been, but when I was at school, I was kind of the cocky, you know, what you would see in a movie, kind of typical douchebag jock. The easiest way to say it is, you know, I was very confident, but I was never really rude to anybody, but a lot of people thought that I was really rude until they got to know me. Um, So I had a lot of friends outside of sports and a lot of my teammates didn't really have team, you know, friends outside, but a lot of my friends didn't play sports or, you know, maybe they didn't play on the elite teams that I was on. So it was kind of a high school was a weird time for me. I mean, it's a weird time for everybody, but yeah. um, it was really weird for me because I was winning these awards and you know I was doing really well in the sports world, but I wasn't so focused on it like everybody else was. Like I, you know, I enjoyed going to the movies and I enjoyed going hiking and I enjoyed going to the lake and I enjoyed reading and I enjoyed going to do these different things that sometimes some of my teammates would, you know, kind of bully or point out things about other people being nerds. And I'm sitting there going, you know, I do that same stuff. So it was kind of weird. I didn't really get along with a lot of my teammates, but I played on a lot of sports teams. Like I got along with them, if that makes sense to a surface level, but not on a deeper connection level. And I think that's kind of continued on with me into my, you know, into my professional career as well. So I would be, you know, a person that I was very um, frustrated, as I said in the opening, you know, kind of frustrated with how things had gone and kind of angry. But at the same time, I was never rude or never tried to be rude to anybody else. I was kind of just a confused individual, as a lot of us are in high school. Mm. You know, I was kind of caught in between wanting to just be myself. And I love reading and, you know, I enjoy some of the quote unquote nerdier things in life. But I was really talented at sports where you're supposed to be this macho you know, kind of manly man, whatever thing. So it was kind of, high school was really strange for me as well as it was for a lot of other people too. That's interesting. Uh, since you mentioned sports earlier, you, you started out in ice hockey. Who was your, who is your greatest motivator? Is it a sports guy or is it a regular scientist or philosopher or, and why? Um, well, I think, you know, of course, growing up for a lot of us, our heroes at early ages are, are for males, it's our, you know, grandfathers or our dads. Mm -hmm. And for me, my grandfather was kind of this sports icon hero in my hometown. Everybody knew who he was. He was this, you know, predominant baseball player. He was super successful or super successful. And um, had had a really great career himself. So everybody knew who he was. So 
I kind of always really looked up to him and I always looked up to my dad um, in my own way as we all kind of have our complicated relationships sometimes with different things. But externally um, in my hometown, ice hockey was everything. And if I would have never been diagnosed with a heart condition, I don't know if I would have ever pursued baseball the same way because I know that I truly love hockey. Mm. So from my hometown, um, there's a lot of very talented ice hockey players that play in the NHL. So those of you that know what the NHL is, um, or those of you that don't, it is the best ice hockey league in the entire world. It's where everybody from around the world that's the top player goes and plays. And from my hometown, there was two brothers that um, both played in the NHL, one of which had won multiple championships. He's now in the Hall of Fame, and he's one wow. of the best defensemen of all time. And I had the benefit of when I was a kid of him teaching me um, during the summers. He taught me lessons. His father was actually my family doctor, so I had a really deep connection with him. So he was somebody that I really grew up liking and you know, really admiring. And I got a lot of advice from him and from his dad and from his brother. So those were kind of people that I really looked up to. Uh, if you want to look them up, uh, their name are Scott and Rob Niedemeyer. Um, they're both two very talented ice hockey players that had very successful and long NHL careers. Um, so those were two people that kind of really motivated me uh, outside of family. And then, like I said, with my family, my grandfather was always somebody that I really wanted to be like. And um, at an early age, my dad was also one of my heroes as well. Mm, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. And um, my next question is, uh, what made you who you are, you know, at this level of where you are uh, in your game? Like, what made you who you are now? Um, I think we all, you know, we all go through life at different levels, right? You, for yourself, Rajiv, or the people that are listening, we all have our own journey and we all have our own lessons along the way. And for myself, the biggest thing that really made me who I am now is the people that at an early age believed in me, whether that was the teacher that, you know, maybe gave me a little bit of extra attention because I was such an energetic kid and realized that I didn't want to sit in the classroom or my coach in high school that, um, you know, pulled me aside and essentially told me to pull my head out of my ass because I was throwing my life away by being angry all the time or by my grandmother who was there for me when different things in my family happened. I think everything that happens in our life or the people that we come in contact kind of shape us. And mm. it's something that we have to be really careful of on another note is we really have to be careful who we allow into our life. But especially in our early years, there's a lot of things that really shape us. So I really attribute who I am now to a handful of people. Um, my mother has had a huge influence on me. I've seen the things that she's been able to go through and, you know, continue pushing through on a day to day basis. And I, you know, she's one of my biggest motivators. Um, and I have a fantastic relationship with her. One of my teachers in elementary school, I'll never forget some of the conversations that I had with him, even though I was such a young kid. And at the time I was kind of naive to the things we talked about. Some of his belief in me is what kind of instilled some things later on in my life. My high school coach, um, you know, who believed in me and when I didn't believe in myself. And then both of my grandmothers who I had, you know, a really deep um, connection with, with both of them. They kind of helped shape me. My grandmothers helped me kind of learn the more, I guess, caring, soft-hearted side of the world, um, you know, kind of showing me that you can still be successful and at the same time give back and be kind to everybody around you because they were two of the, you know, in my mind, they were two of the nicest and uh, open-hearted people that I've ever met or come into contact with. So they kind of showed me how valuable it was to kind of be loving to everybody, whether you know them for five minutes, five seconds, five years, whatever the case is. And my teacher in elementary school really, um, you know, he really showed me the compassion and how impactful an adult can be on child's lives. And I take that into now for myself when I do coaching with kids, um, I do a lot of baseball coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching with kids now, and I, I really don't take it for granted. I know there's a lot of people that do it because you can make good money in it, but mm. 
I do it because I actually really enjoy seeing them be happy. And I know how impactful my teacher was when I was around their age. And so if I can be somebody that's impactful on them and 15, 20 years down the road, they talk amazingly about me, that's something that motivates me or something that kind of shaped me into who I am. Um, my mother kind of going through some of the things that she went, she started her own business and uh, went off into her own, I could kind of create an, her own path and seeing kind of some of the resistance and some of her own friends that were kind of talking smack on her, you know, weren't really believing in her. It showed me how important it is to really have self-belief. And at the end of the day, if we have a couple of people around us to believe us and, you know, we really have a, a passion for what we're doing, we can kind of do anything. Um, so those are, you know, kind of the biggest ones. And then my coach in high school, um, to kind of round out the handful, he, uh, he was a person that pulled me aside and had a very honest conversation with me about where I was at as a, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old kid and said to me, Hey, you know, like, what do you want to do with your life? You can continue being, you know, the, the hot shot from, you know, your hometown, or you can be somebody that goes out and conquers the world. You have to decide what you want. And if you keep going the way that you're going, you're going to be the hot shot that's from your hometown that never leaves. And that really resonated hard with me. And I don't know if it's because of some of his influence that I haven't been back as often, but it really motivated me to be like, you know what, you're right. I don't want to be the person that was successful in high school. And that was my plateau. That's as far as I ever went. So I really try to make sure that I'm conscious of the conversations I'm having with people and, um, you know, making sure that it's always trying to be positive. Of course, we're not always going to have complete positivity in every day because we're all human. We all, you know, we all have up and down days, but at any point, you never know the impact you're having on somebody. So I think all of those people kind of shape me into who I am for sure. Wow. That was, that's so powerful. Uh, in connection, since you mentioned elementary, uh, the, the next question is connected to, how connecting past to, to present is, if today was yesterday, what would you keep and let go of? If I was to take something from now um, that I've learned back to when I was a youth, I think the biggest thing would be to, at the end of the day, people are going to talk about you no matter what you do. So you might as well do what's going to make you happy. As long as it's not something that hurts you physically, mentally, you're not harming those around you. Um, you know, it's such a, you know, it's such a major thing because oftentimes when we're kids, we're so scared to be who we are because, you know, we're scared to have people make fun of us. And oftentimes, even when we transition to adulthood, if you are a free spirit or you're somebody that thinks for yourself, oftentimes you'll have people that don't like that and they'll try to bend your will. They'll be the people that will tell you, no, you shouldn't, you know, try to start that business. No, you shouldn't start that podcast. No, you shouldn't do this because they think they're protecting you and trying to keep you safe. But at the same time, they're just following the mold of what's been taught to us for so long. Mm. So I think I would instill that in myself when I was a kid to be like, you know what, you need to do what is going to make you happy because it, no matter what people are going to talk about you, people are going to say things. So at the end of the day, you might as well do what makes you happy because they're going to say things anyway. And if I could take anything from when I was a kid that I've tried to really remember all the time is that, Time is really a construct of our own minds. So if you really think about it, how, you know, how quickly our lives go by or how slowly our lives go by is really determined by ourselves. And I say that because if you think about the days when you're truly enjoying your life and you're, you know, you're around friends or family where you're really happy, it seems like the day goes by in a snap of a finger. Whereas if you're bored and you're not enjoying life, maybe you're depressed or you're a little down or whatever the case is, days feel like they just slug on. And I think during this whole pandemic and during, you know, these different things that have been going on, a lot of people have kind of got into this weird phase of almost like groundhog day, right? They're repeating hmm. their same day. There's no routine. There's no anything. And so, you know, they're saying, Oh, it feels like it's been a year. Or it feels like it's been three months. Well, when we were kids, days went by so fast because we were always looking for something new, right? We always mm. had that dreamer mindset. We always had that try to find something cool, do different things. And at some point, somebody knocked that out of us. Mm. So if anybody can kind of take something from when we were kids is to always kind of be that kid, ask questions. Who cares if they, you know, if the person doesn't want to answer or the person can't answer it, they shouldn't be talking about what they're telling you anyway. You know, if you're a person that wants to try something, take a risk because at the end of the day, 
when we're 85 years old, you know, and we look back on our life, are we going to be happy that we took those risks and our life went by quickly? Or are we going to be upset because we didn't take any risks and our life felt like it was 800 years? So I think something taking from when I was a youth to now that I've really kind of instilled is I've kept that free spirit where I've talked up when I don't think things are right. I think that's something that all of us need to do. If we truly believe that somebody or something, whether it be family member, friend, coworker, whatever the case is, is doing something that they should not be doing, we have to say something. Because if we don't say something, who's going to? And oftentimes we can be a voice for people that maybe don't have it. And so, you know, being a free spirit and kind of just keeping that dreamer mentality and kind of keeping that fresh lease on life for sure has been something that I've really tried to take from my childhood to now. Wow. You are a powerful speaker. I mean, every single word is, is very powerful. I mean, it's very impactful. Moving <laughs> to the next question is um, we're, we're going to take, uh, we're going to move a little bit forward now. We're going to look, a, we're going to do a little bit of forward thinking. What are your thoughts? Now we're in the pandemic season. Um, what are your thoughts for the future? It can be your future or it can be the future, the future that we're heading into. Um, I think one of the biggest things is, you know, whether, whether a person has read the, the Stoic philosophies of Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, um, or Epictetus, or a person that's read some self-help and personal development or personal growth books, there's always something to take out of those. And something that I really have always appreciated of is the Stoics are written 2000 years ago, but they have relativity today. If you think about it, 2000 years ago, they didn't have computers, they didn't have cell phones, you and I wouldn't have been able to connect the way we are currently, but they dealt with the same things we did. You know, they dealt with daily ups and downs. They dealt with pandemics. They dealt with famine. They dealt with fire. You know, they dealt with floods. They dealt with everything that we all deal with now. But because everything is so much more instant, we take it like, oh, the, you know, nothing has ever happened like this before in anybody's life. Well, back then, they didn't have anything to compare it to. So I really think whether we're in the technology age or we're in you know, kind of the, the modern, modern, as you said, pandemic era, or we're 2000 years ago or 800 years ago or whatever era we're in, we have to really stay focused on the now because we're not promised tomorrow. So if you think the best way to set ourselves up for tomorrow is to live properly today, right? So if I'm a person that says, you know what, like I need to get myself into shape to make sure that my body is able to eradicate the sickness. If I ever, am ever able to get sick or I do ever come into contact with being sick, what is the first thing I can do? Well, I'm not going to go and climb a mountain today because, you know, I'm dealing with my knee injury as we've talked about, but I can go to the gym and get myself in shape. There's always progress that each one of us can do along the way. So I think, of course, it's great to have goals down the road, but we also have to focus on today and alleviating that stress, whether it's by meditating, journaling, reading, going to the gym, talking to a friend, communicating, having that hard conversation. What we do today is going to affect our future. So for me, um, you know, reading is such a huge thing. I, I've recently delved into quite a few different books. The book that I just have just finished is Atomic Habits by James Clear. I think anybody that's listening to this, definitely check out that book. I think that for me has kind of given me a very different perspective on life. If you want to check out the Stoics, like I was talking about, check out Ryan Holiday's collection. He's got some great books on Stoicism. He breaks it down into modern terms, whether it's in his 366 daily um, meditations and philosophies, ego is the enemy, stillness is the key, or uh, obstacle is the way. Those are all great books, as well as kind of just really taking this time to evaluate what I want to do in my future. So for me, you know, I'm in a state where I think the world's about to change. You look at the last time that there was a pandemic like this, or you look at the last time that there was a major shift in the world. A lot of companies that, you know, were around for a long time disappeared. A lot mm -hmm. of industries were created. There's a lot of different things. And I think the opportunities that are ahead of you are truly, you know, magical, right? And, but we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we need to live for today, but be optimistic for tomorrow. So I think for me, staying in the moment by journaling, reading, but also having dreams, like I talked about, kind of instilling that free spirit and really kind of dreaming and motivating 
gets me up every day and helps me kind of stay processed. So I would say for me, my future goals are just to continue learning to be 1% better every day and really focus on the progress of the day. Because at the end of the day, if we progress 1% every single day, by the end of our life, we'll have a pretty high percentage and well-lived life. Thank you so much for those thoughts. It's, it's, it's amazing. And um, for those who are tuning in, probably we'll leave the links of the books, those amazing, phenomenal books on YouTube. Uh, in the links below. Uh, let's get into one of my favorite segments, which is a What Inspires You segment, where it's your own personal monologue, Zach, where you have the ability to speak about what inspires you. And whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think for myself, the biggest thing that, you know, kind of touching on all the points that I've kind of shared so far is for me, the, um, the true amount of success or motivation for me really comes from helping others. So whether it be from doing the, the lessons or the, the teachings with the, the younger kids with baseball, being able to give back to them by me taking my experiences and giving back is, you know, something that I think I should not only do, but it's something that everybody should do. You know, we all have amazing skills and we all have life experiences and to touch on my own podcast a little bit. That's why I started my podcast. I wanted to connect with people. I wanted to share their stories. I wanted to share, you know, motivations for people because I think oftentimes it's so easy, especially nowadays with social media, where we get into this comparative analysis state, right? We go on somebody's Instagram, we go on somebody's Facebook and, Oh, we see they're doing so great. And you know, everything's going great, but we also have to keep in mind social media is a highlight reel. And I say it's a highlight reel because nobody's going to post on social media that, you know, they couldn't get out of bed today because they're depressed. They're going to post that picture where they have that face smile on with the beautiful background and the, you know, all of that stuff. There's no negative things. There are, but not very often do you see that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we really have to stay focused on helping each other and really understanding that everybody's going through something, whether you're on, I love the analogy of books, like, if I'm on my page 25 and somebody else is on their page 10 and they're stuck on page 10, mm. if I can tell them something that maybe helps them flip over to a page 11 or helps them maybe get past that block that all of a sudden they skip from page 10 to 15, like nothing because everything that was blocking them, something I said or something that one of my guests that's been on has been able to help them get through. That's exactly what I want to do. I think I'm a huge believer in the universe and I really think that one of the most inspiring things to me is, is that each one of us has energy inside of us. Each one of us harnesses energy. It, it really is how we decipher and how we decide to output that energy that really affects how we live, right? So every day we're all given the same amount of time. So if I decide in the morning to get up right when my alarm goes off and get up and go move around and send an email off or take care of the things that I need to do, or if I decide to sleep in till one o'clock, which I'm sure we've all done because I know I have, where you sleep in and you feel like half your day's gone and you have no energy, you know, you feel groggy, you don't feel great. It's because we expelled our energy into a, something that, again, some days you need that. And absolutely, some days you do need to sleep like that. But it's very easy for that to slip into being a habit. And when that does become a habit, that's when we're not using our full potential and our full energy. And that's where depression, anxiety, different things like those start setting in. And that can be a very tough road. And I've been down that road. I, you know, I have been into a situation where I've been very depressed. I've been very down. I was not myself. I turned to outlets that I should not have turned to. And, you know, it was, it was difficult. And one of the biggest things that helped pull me back was truly kind of connecting with myself, connecting with the universe. And I think by me being able to share my stories, I know that I don't know everything. And if you end up do listening to my podcast, I talk about that. I don't know everything. I'm trying to be a better person every single day. But if I can share a story with one of your listeners, Rajiv, or one of my listeners, or share a story that I meet with one of the kids or the parents or something like that, something that helps them be 1% better every day, or maybe, you know, give them a different insight on life. That's what truly inspires me because when I was a kid, you know, I talked about the teacher that gave me those insights to 
learn in a different way. He allowed me to be who I was. He gave me some insights that inspired me and still inspires me. And that's, you know, 27 years later or yeah. And, you know, so the thing is, is we never know the impact that we're having on other people around us. And we have to always try to make sure that we're having a completely positive experience. We're not always going to be completely positive and nobody can ever expect that out of you, but we can always choose our perspective. I always use the example, our perspective can either be our prison or our passport to life. I'm going to choose a passport every single time because it means that I'm free, that I'm traveling, that I'm doing things. I'd rather not be in prison. So if we choose to look at things as a positive and see rather than saying, Oh, why is this always happening to me? You can always look at it like life, you know, I'm doing life, not life is happening to me. And I think that's one of the biggest things that, you know, has continued to inspire me is being able to help other people get beyond where they're at because we all have to start somewhere. And oftentimes we hit a plateau and we never know how to get through it. So being able to inspire other people and, I'm truly inspired by connecting with people. Some of the amazing people that I've had on to do interviews or just, you know, connecting with yourself or Jeeve and having the conversation that we've done, I'm inspired by you. You're a person that has gone through a lot of stuff too. And that's something that we all have to truly accept about ourselves too, is that we've gone through things. And oftentimes we always look at, as I said, social media or different things like that. And we go, Oh, well, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But, what did they go through to get there? And what have you gone through to get to where you're at? If, if you know, if we sometimes do a, a back check and we look at all the stuff that we've gone through, humans are amazing. We go through a hell of a lot of stuff to get to where mm. we're at. And oftentimes we get so consumed by, oh, we need this next, we need this next, or we need this, that we forget about all the things that we've done. And I'm not saying you should celebrate every single day for everything that you've done, but you should also be in a state of perspective knowing that, you know what? There's a lot of other people that are struggling where you were at. So if you can help them come forward, it's going to help you move forward too. So I think those are the biggest things that kind of inspire me. Um, hopefully there's some good information in there for everybody. And um, yeah. Awesome. And uh, a, a little bit of short, uh, short philosophy before we go to our break. Could you give us a, a particular quotation or, or a philosopher's quote that you live by or anything that that you stand by that that you know you use as a as a spotlight every time you hit like like you mentioned earlier a pl plateau is there a quotation that you go back like a word from a famous uh, as a famous nfl uh nfl or uh, a baseball player's quotation that you live by when you wake up every morning okay i'm gonna use this uh, to to fire me up for the day i have three I have right. one from a sports, I have one from a sports person. I have another one from a stoic that I spoke of, and I have another one from an influential author of his time. So the first one that I always talk about is from Seneca. And he is one of the stoics um, that kind of was one of the fathers of stoicism. And he talks about if you live for others, it will help you live for yourself. And I really, that one reign true to me where if you really live to give back to other people and you live to help other people it will in, it empower your life and it will help you live a much more successful and i guess fulfilled life and so that was one that always really stands out to me another one hockey um wayne gretzky is known as the great one he's one of the you know the greatest all-time athletes but he is the greatest all-time hockey player and something that he kind of said in passing that he kind of said as a joke in an interview, but it really is so true is, you know, that he broke the record for the most goals ever. And he, you know, he did all these amazing things. And one of the reporters asked him, well, what is your philosophy or what, you know, what do you think? And he's like, well, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And I've always thought of that because for myself, I would rather take an opportunity and fail than never take that opportunity because maybe on the other side of failure, I find something out about myself or I find an even better, more amazing opportunity. I really look at life in the essence of, I would rather jump out of the plane with no parachute and build the parachute on the way down, figure out a way to do it than never get in the plane. So 
I really like that, you know, you miss a hundred, you miss a hundred percent of the opportunities or hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And then the last one is from Albert Einstein, where he says, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. And I really believe that because if you look at some of the biggest difficulties that each and every one of us has had, everybody's story is different. But I know for myself that anytime I've faced adversity, I've faced friction, I've had a difficulty of some sort, whether it be losing my you know, losing my opportunity to play baseball with my shoulder, having my knee injury, having different things happen to me. Every time that happens, it presents an opportunity to you where it says, okay, you have the opportunity to wallow in it and go backwards, or you have the opportunity to go forward. And oftentimes opportunity are presented us to us in a weird way. The universe, God, the divine entity, whatever you would like to believe in presents it to us in a different way. So if we're a person that says we want to do something, the, op- the universe or God will present something that goes against that to us. And if we choose that thing that goes against us to us, then we're not going to find the opportunity. Whereas maybe the difficulty along the line was we were chasing the wrong thing the whole time. And if we're able to see that, maybe it be friends in our circle that are negative. Maybe it be people that really shouldn't be in our inner circle that we let be in there that we didn't protect our health confidence from as soon as we eradicate those situations from our situation, opportunity usually presents itself. So those are the three that I really, um, that have really rained out for me for a long time. I have a lot more, but those are three that are very, um, you know, very powerful for me. Thank you so much. Uh, with that in mind, we'll just go on a short break and we'll be right back. Calling in collectors from around the Philippines. Are you looking for a valuable history lesson about Baguio City? Or you just want to collect stuff that brings you back in time? Check out Hobby Depot Baguio which is located at Puis No. 8 Prudential Life Building below Jollibee, Assumption Road, Baguio City. You can also find them on Facebook at Hobby Depot Baguio. Hobby Depot Baguio the one-stop shop for everything hobby related welcome back folks i'm here with zach johnson a phenomenal phenomenal motivational speaker sports person and very deep philosopher and we're gonna get into art talk segment i know uh, earlier on we were talking about sports for me personally i look at sports as a form of art it's whether you're in a whether you're in an ice rink or you're in a football field, you're still, you're still painting a picture where people are inspired to watch you. And I do not know if Zach, do you agree with what I said? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, athletics, just like uh, artistic uh, formation, is it is, a, it is a form of artistic expression. If you look at the artist or painter or author when they first start out, they have to put in the effort. They have to put in the training to get better. Of course, you're going to meet some people like Mozart or, you know, different people along the line that were just prodigies from an early onset. But for most people, they have to hone their craft. So I definitely do believe that it is a art form. It is a form of artistic expression, just in a different manner. Absolutely. And um, the first question is, of course, you mentioned practice. Practice uh, Practice is life, I guess, for, uh, from an from artist's point of view. And um, how do you, if you get into, into the game, uh, especially with, uh, let, let's talk about baseball since you're, you're more dominant now in baseball, is that mm-hmm. uh, what is your philosophy on practice uh, and how, how does that develop into life? Um, well, I think just, you know, the same as, Anybody that's, whether it be an entrepreneurship business, um, you know, a person that's looking to write a book, a person that's looking to create a painting, anything like that, we have to understand the reason why we're doing it. We have to be passionate about it. You can't be completely engulfed or totally focused on something if you're not passionate or you don't enjoy it. If you think about when we're in school, right? If we don't enjoy a subject, how often do we do succeed in it? Not very often. So the same thing with sports. If we, if we find something that motivates us and we enjoy it, um, 
it's a lot easier. And that's why I think for a lot of people, it's tough for them to understand, but in professional sports, it is a business. And so for a lot of people, they lose that love of the sport because once that business side comes in, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that people don't see that is a demotivator. And Mm -hmm. for a lot of guys that I played with, including myself, at some point that hits you in the face and it kind of is a realization that you're no longer just playing the game for the love of the game. You're doing it because people are either making money off of you or you're making money because you're playing it. And so being focused and being practical and training properly is so important because that helps you recenter on why you love the game. Because at practice, you can fool around a little bit and kind of do like what you used to do when you were a kid and kind of fall back in love with it. Whereas, you know, in a game, if you fool around, you make a mistake, that could cost that organization money. So Mm. it's really, um, training is such a vital thing. And I think for anybody that has had the opportunity to play professional sports at any level, it is such an amazing experience. And you really do have to find that thing that connects you to the love of the game and doesn't take you away from it. The same way as you hear some painters or some authors or some musicians, they get sick of it after a while because they feel like it's just, you know, it's beating their head against the, you know, beating their head against the wall. And Einstein had another quote saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, if you go into something with the same mindset all the time, and you never change that. You're never going to get a different result. So I think like anything in life, you have to have your perspective in tune, whether it be for sports, for business, for life, for school, whatever the case is, you have to really have a passionate perspective on why you're doing it. Otherwise at some point those cracks are going to come through and your foundation is going to fall apart. Uh, you mentioned uh, focus. Um, this was the, interesting. You, you you mentioned the word focus. I I really wanted to dabble into that word focus because um, uh, for those who haven't seen the Last Dance, of course, the Michael Jordan ESPN special. You know, Michael Jordan takes things personally when he is in the court, and uh, I'm sure every at, athlete. I, I'm sure you agree with me is that when when you're in the when you're in the field or wherever you are uh, performing, you have to use the, something as a motivation to fire you up to, you know, get the job done. You know, and of course, our famous legend who passed away, Kobe Bryant, has that famous word called the Mambo mentality. Uh, what is your, your focus? Like, wh- how, do you, how do you get into the mind of, uh, of your, your opponent? Do you get into their head? Do you trash talk them a bit? Or do you trash talk yourself in order to, to say, okay, I'm going to kick this, this person's, uh, this team. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, you're going to, you know, self-talk where you, you talk to yourself and say, hey, I, I, we need to get this thing done. Or you, you know, how do you get into your, uh, to your mindset when, when you're playing? Do you take it personally or how do, how do you do that? That's a very curious question that I've always wanted to ask a sports person. Yeah. So um, for myself, I, you know, I also watched the, the Last Dance documentary and something that really stood out to me from that is you look at how, um, you know, you mentioned Kobe as well, but you mentioned how Michael Jordan had this killer mentality, right? He had this, you look at him on the court and he would yell at his teammates. He'd be somebody that would demand his teammates to be better because he demanded that from himself. And for me, I got away from that because at a certain level, um, baseball, you can't really do that the same way as you can in basketball or in hockey. It's just because the way the game is played, but for myself to mentally prepare myself, I have a routine that I follow. So I have a pregame routine where I warm up and stretch the same way to make sure my body's ready to go. And then I do a small meditation before the game. And at the minute I finish that meditation, it's game over. It's like a snap of the finger. I completely lock in to whereas it doesn't matter if it's my best friend across the field from me, I'm going to kill that person. We're going to win the game. I, I look at it as a war mentality in the essence that they're coming to take the food off my table because if I don't play well enough, I'm going to lose my job. So I'm not letting them take the food off my table. Um, I really 
I know some, I've had teammates along the line where, you know, they like to joke around. Everybody has their thing where they like to joke around. They, they're super serious. They're locked in. Some people, you know, they don't even talk about baseball when they're playing. For me, I lock in and my teammates that recognize that leave me alone. They don't talk to me for the whole game because they just know that I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to joke around. I'm very focused. I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. I'm writing in my notebook. I am, you know, paying attention to the other team. I'm going to talk trash to them when I'm on bases. So for those of you that know baseball, there's first, second, third base and home plate. I'm going to talk a little bit of trash, you know, to the pitcher when I'm hitting. I play outfield, so it's not as easy to talk trash when you're on defense, but um, do talk a little bit of smack, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be the loudest person ever. I usually like to let my play speak for itself. So I've been very successful where I've hit a few home runs and I've had a few different situations in my career where I've, uh, you know, been successful. So I've been able to kind of let my play back up my mentality. But as soon as the game ends, I come back to normally who I am. My, you know, I'm very, very soft spoken and yeah. we'll sit there and talk to the fans for, you know, an hour. I take pictures with the kids, sign autographs and things like that. But if they ask me during the game, absolutely not 0% chance. And a lot of people have at some point thought I was a complete asshole because of how I was during the game. But it's just that I, you know, I realize how hard I've worked to get to that point that I'm not going to let some kid throw me off during the game. Like they're there to watch the game after the game, by all means, come and talk to me. But if you throw me off during the game and then I lose my food off my table because of that, I'm going to be pissed at myself. So just getting it locked into that mindset. And that's something that a lot of people don't see from professional athletes is it's so hard to stay in that mindset that sometimes when you are in that mindset, people think you're an asshole because you're just locked in. Well, you're just trying to stay focused to get your job done. Cause that, at the end of the day, that's your job. And so you have to have that something that fires you up and locks you off, whether it's that meditation, whether it's that music, like you said, Michael Jordan, taking that thing offensively and ready to go out there and rip the other person's head off, whatever the case is, everybody, has to find that. And I think it's transitional, not only from sports, but just to life too, right? Like if you have something, if you're sitting and doing your homework and your friend calls you 25 times and you decide to answer every single time, you're letting that person take you out of your mode. You need to tell that person, Hey, I'm doing my homework. And if they don't respect that, tell them to screw off. Same thing. You know, if you're trying to start a business and you need to spend later nights staying up, figuring out the financial situation, figuring out the laws, figuring out the rules, figuring out whatever you have to do. You can't have the TV on in the background because it's going to distract you away. You have to lock in and focus. And I think that's something that's kind of been lost in the modern day with all the technologies. We're constantly bombarded by notifications, by sounds, by different things going on around us that we have to be able to find that situation of being locked in. So I think we all have it in us. It's just a matter of whether you decide to tap into it and use that energy or not. Um, I'm scared to face you now, coming to think of what you said. I'm scared to even think of asking you to go to a thing, play baseball. I, I'm, I'm scared you might rip my head off now. <laughs> 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 I'd love to dig in that. To be honest, I, I'd love this. This, is, this intense conversation about baseball is one thing that I've always wanted. I always wanted to actually interview athletes because I want to get into the mindset and how they play the game. I hope you and I further in, in, in our uh, upcoming episodes or upcoming seasons, we should make a season for all the, uh, all the fans, baseball fans. You know, I want to dig into the mindset and deconstruct how it is to get into sports since you mentioned ice hockey, baseball. You know, I, I would love to dig in, dive, and have a conversation with you in the next season. I hope that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to be on, and I, uh, I appreciate you letting me come on and talk. Awesome. Uh, with that, uh, if someone, uh, my listeners, decide to connect with you via social media, how do they connect with you? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, how do they connect with you? Um, yeah, if a person wants to follow along, the easiest is on Instagram. If you want to follow along, um, the Instagram handle is the limitless production. And if you want to check out my podcast, it's called the limitless possibilities podcast talks about some of the insights that I've shared a little bit 
as well as I have some great guests come on. So far, I've had multiple professional athletes. I've had entrepreneurs. I've had people that have gone from being broke and homeless to now being very successful in business come on. I, I've had some very inspiring stories. Me as the host, I get super inspired um, the way that I hope that some of my stories are inspiring you guys just by recording and listening to these people, I get inspired. So I hope if you are able to check that out, that'd be great. Um, you can find it on any of the platforms where podcasts are hosted. And uh, yeah, that's the easiest. So check it out on Instagram. Again, it's the Limitless Production and check out the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you find your podcast at. And it's the Limitless Possibilities Podcast. Awesome. Uh, with that in mind, thank you, dear legend. I, I am a huge fan. <laughs> I'm going to consider you now a baseball legend in my books. Um, thank you so much, dear legend, for having this conversation with me. I'm looking forward to future conversations with you. And um, with that in mind, uh, thank you again. Thank you again for coming to the Rajiv show. Thank you very much again for having me on, Rajiv. And uh, I definitely hope that all the listeners are able to get some amazing stuff out of it and definitely continue to support his podcast because I think he's doing some great things as well. Awesome. And um, uh, I hope my listeners had picked up a thing or two with, with your philosophy and your life and uh, everything, everything else in between. And for those who are tuning in, cheers. I will see you in the next episode.